So, for this brisket video, the following items were used. A Traeger smoker, a smokehouse blend of wood pellets, which the wood pellets were hickory, oak, maple, and cherry. A home blend of seasoning, that'll, go, that'll be gone over later. A knife so we can cut the fat and cut the meat when it's all done. Cutting boards, obviously, <laughs> you're gonna need cutting boards for this. Mustard to help the seasoning adhere or stick to the meat. You can wear gloves, that is optional, but I would suggest if you're not gonna wear gloves to so definitely wash your hands. A digital thermometer, this is gonna come in handy so then we'll know what the internal temperature is gonna be. This is gonna be in, come in handy when we're getting towards the end stage of cooking our meal. A cube, uh, we put this inside the smoker because it adds a little bit more wood flavor. A lighter or torch, we use this to ignite the wood pellets in that little cube, or at least to get it the least smoke. We also want cooking spray that's specifically nonstick to spray the grates before we put the brisket on. Also, I should mention that in the event of bad weather conditions, it may be necessary to bring the brisket inside to get the internal temperature to the right temp. And that right temp is 195 degrees to 205 degrees. Let's just say Fahrenheit for now. So you want it between that 195 and 205 degrees, and that's going to let you know that the meat is done. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson, and welcome to Millennial Meals. This is going to be a show where we show you how to make some delicious treats or meals right at your own house. And I thought, you know, for the first episode and for the first meal, I think it should be something big. Something that's delicious, that's kind of like for the Midwest. So I think today, today's meal should be brisket. <laughs> so before you bring your brisket home, when you're at the store, you need to test how much fat is in the brisket, because that's going to be important when you're cooking it, and also reduces the amount of work if you're cutting out a lot of fat. So when you are at the store, what you want to do is you want to see if you can not bend the brisket and almost have both ends touching. What this means is that there's not a lot of fat in this brisket, and not only that, that means it's less work for us to do when we start trimming all this fat. So now that we have the brisket out of its packaging, now we need to trim the fat. Now, based on the brisket that you picked in the store, will determine on how much fat you have to remove from the meat itself. So a good rule of thumb is that you want about a quarter inch of fat on your brisket. Anything more, we want to kind of trim that off. And sometimes the brisket that you get at the store might be a little bit different, but again, the whole idea here is, is that we want to try and remove all this fat. And like I said, we want to leave about a quarter inch on the brisket itself. So after that, then we'll begin seasoning the brisket. All right, so now that we have the brisket trimmed, now we're gonna be able to put our seasoning or flavor or whatever thing you wanna put on. So first thing that we usually put on is mustard, at least for our brisket, because the reason why is it kind of helps the, um, helps hold the seasoning a little bit better into the brisket. And not only that, it's good flavor. So make sure like whatever thing you wanna put on here, or at least in this case, the mustard that you put it on there nice and thick then if you're using gloves you can I personally am using gloves today you kind of spread it over your brisket so you kind of got it nice and even because think of this as like the thing that's gonna hold that seasoning or whatever thing you're wanting to use into your brisket you might get it all over on the sides the top even the bottom. So keep in mind when it comes to seasoning your brisket, you don't have to necessarily put any type of seasoning. A lot of times smoking the brisket will already give it a fantastic flavor. But in some cases, for people like me, <laughs> I like to add a little bit of seasoning to my thing. So in case you're curious of what type of seasoning I used or the ingredients, here's what I used and the ingredients as follows. Two tablespoons of smoked paprika, two tablespoons of kosher salt, of course, one tablespoon of black pepper, one teaspoon of cayenne pepper, two teaspoons of garlic powder, and then finally, two teaspoons of onion powder. Now, when you have these ingredients, obviously you wanna kinda of mix them together. Make sure you try to cut down on any like really coarse and chunky bits. You wanna make sure it's really kinda of like even, so it's like 
as uniform and as mixed together as possible. And uh, I would say the easiest thing to do as far as like trying to season your brisket, find a seasoning like a little salt shaker or some kind of seasoning shaker that you've used up and just pour the ingredients in there and then that would be the easiest way that you can use or something that you can use to flavor your brisket to shake some of that seasoning on there. So as we're putting on our seasoning, when you kind of get towards the edge, you want to make sure you're kind of like cupping it on the side. Because I mean, we don't want to lose all of our stuff. We want to kind of keep every little bit of seasoning on our brisket. So we don't want to lose the concoction that we made or whatever flavor you're wanting to use. So again, like when you're kind of getting like to these edges, make sure you kind of cup it on the side. So then we can get every little bit that you know, have every little bit as possible covered with our delicious seasoning or whatever thing you want to use to try and make your brisket really pop. So after when you're done seasoning the fat side, I should mention that the fat side is what's going to be down when we throw this thing in the smoker. So then, basically on the fat side, we're going to do the same exact thing. But we're going to season it as evenly as we can. When we get to those edges, we just make sure we have our hand kind of covering that side, and we just start seasoning. Now I should mention that sometimes it's easier to do it when you have a when you have an assistant, but today we're, I'm going to be the lone ranger and making this brisket by myself. All right, so depending on what level of your smoker, at least what smoker you have and how much uh, pellets you have, you might need to refill it. This one's kind of uh, pretty much full, but I'm just gonna top it off because, you know, why not? You have the ability to do it, let's do it right now. So on this trigger, what we wanna do is we wanna set it about 225, and then we wanna just wanna wait until Trigger is 225 for a person. Alright, so one of the things that we use in the Trigger is called the Q. And with that, you kind of fill it with wood pellets from top to bottom. And one thing that we usually do to make it a little bit easier to light, we'll put a paper towel inside the top, douse it with a little bit of olive oil, and then light it up. And usually, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get it nice and smoking without us having to maintain the fire. Once the cube is smoking nicely, we'll want to place it in the smoker and then spray the grates before we put our brisket in the smoker and leave it overnight or whatever time frame you set. The main thing we're wanting is the smoker temp to be 225 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll have to resupply your smoker with more wood pellets as needed. Once it gets closer to being done, we'll want to put in our meat probe or digital thermometer to see what the internal temperature is. The temp range that we're gunning for is between 195 degrees and 205 degrees. Now when the meat probe hits the temp range that we want, it'll be time to pull the brisket off the smoker. While it's doable to take the large brisket off the grill by yourself, it may be wiser to get some help with it. Alright, so now that we have our brisket here, we hit our nice golden temperature of 203 degrees on the inside. Now, at this point in the game, what we want to do is we want to let the brisket just sit here and press because we want the juices to kind of like seep back into the brisket. But we're going to wait about an hour, an hour and a half, and after that, we're going to cut into this delicious little, <laughs> just this delicious meal. But trust me, the wait is going to be totally worth it. It's going to taste great. It's going to be awesome. One hour later. When you start cutting, be sure to start at the flat end of the brisket, which is usually the smaller side of the brisket, the one that's a little bit lower and not as wide on the brisket. 
So when cutting, you want to cut against the grain of the meat as you slice off the portions you want. For brisket, the goal is to have a smoky, delicious piece of meat that won't fall apart, but instead is easy to pull apart and is tender. After the meat has the hour and a half or hour wait time, it's time to cut the brisket. So when you're cutting the brisket, you're gonna to wanna to cut against the grain. So we're gonna to wanna to cut at this angle right here. Now depending upon like how much like fat or anything like that, your uh, steak or your brisket should be, could be, it could determine like the moistness of the meat like right here. But what you want to do is you want to try and cut some thin slices off or if you want to cut off a big chunk, you can do that too. But it's a lot easier to eat afterwards when you kind of got, you know, thin slices like to serve people. Usually what I do is uh, for like serving sizes, I use about, about five ounces of this brisket. And that usually leaves me pretty nice and full. Now, some pieces you're going to get are going to have a lot more fat on it than others. And the easiest way to tell on that is you'll see like um, this white kind of like squishy substance. That's the fat. Now, personally, me, I love having the fat on my brisket. I think it has a lot of flavor. But I know other people, they just really do not like having brisket with the fat on it. So um, the easiest way is just find someone in your house that likes the fat, give it to them. And then the people who want the leaner cuts of meat kind of like this that doesn't really have any fat on it you just give that to the person who doesn't want any fat but if anything though i would say this is how you cook a brisket Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson and welcome to Millennial Meals. This is a show where we show you how to create delicious meals or treats right at your own house without breaking the bank. Well anyways, today I think that we're going to do something a little bit more simple. Last one was a brisket video and that one required a lot more work. Well today, we're going to do roast beef. So for vegetables, you're going to need carrots, celery, onions, mushrooms, garlic, and pork rinds. Oh wait, yeah, that's for me. So for the equipment, you're going to want a crock pot a stove top or hot plate, forks or a grabbing utensil. So when we're cooking the actual roast beef, you may not want to touch it with your hands because certain sides may be pretty hot. You'll want a skillet or a pan, obviously, so you can cook the meat on, a knife so you can cut your vegetables, a cutting board, <laughs> well, to cut your vegetables on, and then vegetable oil to kind of like put inside the pan or skillet to cook our roast beef. And also I forgot to mention, you also need cooking spray to put inside your crock pot. All right, so here's some of the things that we're gonna need for this video today. Well, you're gonna need some to cook it like a stove top or maybe like a hot plate. Well, personally, I wanna use a hot plate because I wanna be able to work on the island and be able to talk to y'all while everything is being said and done. I'm using a cast iron skillet. Now you don't have to use this, but one thing I'll have to say is don't use olive oil on this because what it'll do is it'll cause a lot of smoking. Uh, I mean, I guess depending upon your preference, I, I don't want smoke personally. So some of the vegetables that we're going to have, we're going to have one medium sized onion, which I'm going to slice later on so you can kind of get an idea of that. About three cloves of garlic. Now keep in mind, this is not three bulbs. This is three cloves that come, woo, <laughs> three cloves that comes from the bowl. And about a half a deal of mushrooms. So not the whole thing or half a mushroom. So basically we want half of this little container. But then again, this is your preference. So if you like a lot of mushrooms, also this does have a lot of vitamin B, which a hey, little bonus back. Um, you can use a half a bag of baby carrots or a whole bag. Personally, I like carrots, so I'm gonna use a whole bag. Um, also the other vegetable will be celery stalks. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna use about five slices. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut them into about one inch segments. And that way I just have some little variety of the vegetables I have inside this crock pot. Um, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna show how I'm gonna slice all of this. And then after that, we're gonna go over the seasonings. Luckily, this isn't gonna be like the brisket video where it seemed like we had a laundry list. This one only has about two ingredients. Now keep in mind, if you want to, you can cut the vegetables into smaller portions if you want, and that's perfectly fine. But in this instance, I wanna keep the carrots and the mushrooms to be um, just how they came out of the packaging because I kind of like to have my vegetables like that to be a little bit more bite-sized portion than slicing them up. Now for the garlic, when you pull off your piece of clove, it's going to have all this wrapping around it. 
Well, what I like to do is I like to cut the end off with a knife and then smash it down with a knife. Reason being is it makes it a lot easier to pull off all that peel. Well, as long as you don't lose it. But I like being able to do that because it makes that job a lot easier. If you don't, you can still do it, but like I said, cutting off the end and then smashing it down is a lot easier. Now for seasonings, we're gonna have four ingredients. So we're gonna have one tablespoon of onion powder and two teaspoons of garlic powder. And the next two is just a little sprinkling of salt and pepper. This is gonna be done when we're cooking the sides of the roast beef. So you're gonna sprinkle this kind of like, I guess to your preference, but kind of sparingly. Now as a bonus ingredient, if you want to, you can use an onion recipe soup and dip mix one pack and you can use it from this brand shown here. Well, hi there. Now we're at the stage where we want to cook our roast beef. Well, what we're going to basically be doing is we're going to be browning all four sides, or I should say all the sides of this nice, lovely little roast beef. Now, depending upon the roast beef you have, you might need to trim off the fat, but this one's pretty good, so we don't have to really worry about that so much. Now, with this, we want to make sure we put a little bit of vegetable oil on here to brown this. Now, when you first start, you want to put the fat side down. So, we start, and we want to get it to where all sides are brown. Once everything is brown, then what we're going to do is we're going to put it inside our crock pot to cook this lovely little roast beef. And what I should mention is while you're cooking, you want to put a little bit of salt and pepper on you know, all the sides. So while it's cooking, so like the side that's being cooked, you don't have to worry about that right now. But we want to hit all the sides with the roast, with this little salt and pepper. Now you don't have to, you can use whatever mix you want, but in this specific scenario, I am only going to use salt and pepper. Um, the seasoning though, what we created earlier, that's going to be for at the end, which is going to be when we have it in the crock pot itself. Now every once in a while, you want to check your your meat. So we want to make sure we get it brown. So right now it looks pretty good. So I'm going to hit the other side. It's going to be on the left hand side. If you do have a little bit of spillage, make sure you just clean it up. That's about as brown as I want to get it. You can see that, nice little browning. Now I'm going to cook this bottom part. Let's check to see how it's like. Yeah, it looks pretty good. You can see, I kind of like that. All right, so. Now remember that fat side that we had earlier? I'm trying to hit that with a little bit of seasoning. So sometimes it's necessary, like depending upon the shape of your roast beef, that you have to hold it like at an awkward angle. This is why I'm like saying like you don't know, have to fork in case you can't handle the heat. Because luckily I cooked it in such a way that it wasn't too hot, so it's not going to burn my hand anytime soon. Also, I should mention, make sure you wash your hands before you're handling the meat like this. Before and after. Also, I should mention, if you have a cast iron skillet, be careful of the handle, because sometimes that can be hot. All 
All right, now that the roast beef has been cooked on all four sides, what we want to do is we want to throw it inside our crock pot, and then next we're going to be throwing in all of our seasonings. So, a little seasoning of onion powder and garlic powder that we made earlier, well, it's coming into play right now. So make sure you kind of like spread it a little evenly around your roast beef, so then that way you get a little bit more of that flavor in the food that you are about to eat in four to five hours. Now, what I should mention is that it's optional, but you could add a little soup mix, but the one I'm using is this Chef's Cupboard onion mix. Now, remember, you don't have to do it. You can go crazy, you can try your own thing, but with this specific recipe, that is what I want to do. I want to add little different flavorings. Again, you don't have to do this. You can just stick with the seasoning, or if there's anything else that you see that you think will be delicious when it comes to your meal, then I would say go for it. Now next is we want to put on the veggies. So when you're putting on the veggies, just make sure you kind of like get it around the sides because you kind of want to make it to where more it's surrounding the food that you're trying to make. All right, so again, what you want to try and do is you want to try and surround your roast beef with the vegetables that you're about to put on. You get a little bit on top, it's not a big deal because everything's going to be pretty much cooked inside the same deal anyways. And this one's going to be really vegetable packed. Alright, so as a final thing, we want to do is, like right before we put on our fancy little lid, we're going to put one cup of water and then we're going to put it on high. One cup. All right, now that our water is in, now we have to have this crock pot set to high, a high temperature, and we wait about four to five hours. So <laughs> it's gonna take a while, but remember, this is millennial meals, not one minute meals. So I'll see you guys back in four to five hours. All right, so it's been a little over, like just a hair under five hours, so one of the first things you want to do when you're checking um, your roast beef is you want to check what the internal temperature is. So you want between 195 and 210. And right now we're at 200 and we're at a little under 5 hours. So if <laughs> this roast beef is ready. So um, when you're trying to get the roast beef, obviously you want to be safe. So I'm going to turn this bad boy off because, well, there's no need for it to be cooking any longer. So I'm not going to grab this with my hands because, well, I don't want to get any burns. But I suggest is getting fork. Ooh, and that is falling apart. That is very tender. So that's one piece of the roast beef. <laughs> Here's the second piece. This literally fell off the bone. So if you want an idea of what tender is, I falling off the bone. That literally happened when I was doing that. This is what. You know, this is a roast beef right here, literally falling off the bone. So that was uh, Millennial Meals, and this was how to make roast beef. Hey there y'all, this is going to be a special episode of Millennial Meals, this will be an unboxing video of Meet Your Maker Meat Grinder, a 500 watt meat grinder. We're going to unbox it, show its contents, and grind some meat. Alright y'all, so this is going to be the beginning of opening the box. So when you're opening boxes, just be careful, make sure you cut away from yourself. And I am wondering how cool this toy is. Also make sure you cut properly so you don't have like these weird little splay marks. Right, so we got a box within a box. Hello. All right. So I guess that box is kind of used for safety purposes so that your original gets, it's like the contents doesn't get too smashed up. So I wasn't expecting two boxes within one. I guess it's almost kind of like one of those nesting eggs. All right. So it's pretty simple. We got our instruction manual right here. 
be some stuff for the meteor grinder. And let's see if we can't rip this out. And I should say, make sure you have a lot of surface area, because obviously this one picks up a little bit. All right. All right, so here we go. We got our, that was a little loud. All right guys, so basically what these are, these are your meat grinding plates. So this is gonna be what's gonna be processing our meat. So then it actually kind of comes out in a more usable way. So then it's not like just one solid chunk of meat is gonna be more ground up. Here's our actual machine, you know, where all the power is basically at. This thing right here is basically your plunger thing. So instead of you putting your fingers um, inside the thing, trying to put, push the meat in to make it kind of squeeze out, you use something that doesn't feed your fingers in the meat because remember we want to make sausages or patties with the meat we're buying, not with our own body. Um, this little pan right here is what we actually put our meat in. So then, you know, whatever kind of meat you're buying, so it could be like beef, pork or something, this is where we're going to put it in. And kind of like I was saying earlier, you know, we have our little plunger right here and then we can push the meat inside. Remember, don't use your fingers because we want to make sure we have all of our digits so we're not cutting them off. Um, what I should say is that these are your sausage, uh, sausage stuffers. So basically it will help. So like basically the meat's going to go in and it's going to be coming out, you know, in a more uniform and smaller form. So it makes it easier for us to make sausages if that's what you want to do. But um, what we're going to do first is we're going to wash this because any type of equipment that you get, you need to wash it before you use it because you don't know how um, well it was cleaned or what kind of process it went through before it got to your house. And plus, we want to make sure that our meat doesn't get contaminated by the machine parts. Then also, it's also kind of like a good insurance for us because we know that everything will be nice and clean before the meat that we buy and then that we're going to prepare to make a delicious meal is ready to go and is clean and is not contaminated. So, in the next little break, you're, or after this little break, you're going to see a nicely assembled meat grinder and we're going to grind some pork. So when you get your Meet Your Maker grinder, here's the items that should be in your package. A 4.5 millimeter grinding plate, a stuffing plate, a 10 millimeter grinding plate, an auger, head locking knob, front ring nut, cutting knife, the head or where a lot of the parts go into, the tray, or as I like to call it, the meat funnel basically, a stomper and stomper cover, and then for the funnels that actually kind of case our sausages, a 30 millimeter funnel, a 20 millimeter funnel, and then lastly, a 10 millimeter funnel. All right, so now that everything is washed, now we want to assemble our grinder. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to put on the head, this head piece right here onto our grinder. Now, if you notice, there's a little divot right here that's cut into the metal. So we're going to put that in here like so. And the reason why I want to have this end point out like this is because this knob goes into that divot. So now this thing ain't going to fly around. Next, what we want to do is we want to put in our auger. Now make sure this little nut end goes inside like this because there's a female piece on the inside that will catch on to it. Now this is our cutting knife. And what we want to make sure is that this faces outward towards this little grinding plate. So we're going to put that on here in the little square piece. Now we have our grinding plate, which is 10 millimeter. Now, if you notice, there's a little notch that's cut out. So what we want to do is we want to line that notch with this corresponding piece, this little bump right here, like so. So it's on there right there. Now we got our front ring nut last. So we're going to screw that on. Oops. So we're going to screw that on like so. So now that's on. Now, last but not least, we want to put our tray or hopper on, or our, as I like to call it, the meat funnel. So we're going to put that on, and now it's clean and it's ready to grind. So um, right after this, we're going to start grinding some meat. So see you right after this. Hi there, y'all. Now we are fully assembled. We got our meat cut up, our pork shoulder, Boston butt, or pork butt. Now we are cutting it, well, we had it cut up in one inch slices because it's gonna make it a lot easier to go down in the funnel. So what we wanna do is we don't, we, we wanna try and mix it up. So a little bit of meaty bits and others are a little bit more fatty because we kinda of want it to be a little bit more even. So 
It's kind of hard to see it. You probably can't see it in the camera, but there's this little arrow or this little notch on this little knob. What we want to do is we want to turn that all the way down to grind. Now, what I should mention is that you don't want to keep the grind or any of the other functions on for very long if you're not cutting up some meat because that could be bad for the machine. But with all, with all that said, we are ready to grind up some meat. Alright, so what we have just ground up is about five pounds of pork shoulder and we got a lot more to go. But to give you an idea, this is, you know, you saw what those little pieces looked like and now this is what they look like after all ground up. Um, next, what I'm going to show you is we're just going to be solid minutes of just grinding meat. And then after, I'm going to tell you some things about the other pieces that make it easier when it comes to storage. Other than that, that'll be up right next. Alright, so next what we're going to do is all that nice coarse meat that we have. Now we're going to do it one more time, but now this time we're going to use a finer grind. So this one's going to be a lot more tighter. So now we're going to start grinding. So we just got done grinding over 40 pounds of pork shoulder. Um, I gotta say, this, this meat grinder has actually done a pretty good job. Uh, so when it comes to grinding your sausage or your pork shoulder, beef or whatever, you can do a lot of different things with it. So for me, for instance, I just had this about five ounce patty and it's like Italian sausage, like as far as the seasoning is concerned. And so I'll put that recipe up here. So then you can get an idea of like, if you want to try it. So uh, what I should say is it's a two pound recipe for the seasoning. But one thing I wanted to show you guys, at least something I like personally, um, so when you get done um, with this Meet Your Maker 500 watt meat grinder, there's something I kind of like as far as the stomper is concerned. So these other pieces that you can use for sausage, well, you can kind of store them together, put them in your stomper, and put two of those little discs or the little cutting blades, and bam, you're ready to go. But that is one fun thing I just want to show you guys as far as like storage is concerned. But other than that, uh, this was the first Millennial Meals unboxing video, the Meet Your Maker Grinder 500 Watt Meat Grinder. See you guys next time. Hi there guys, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson and welcome to Millennial Meals. So on this episode, we're going to be making crustless pizza. Now you may be thinking, well, okay, don't you need dough to make a pizza? Or, because I mean, that's one of the basic building blocks for it. Well, yes and no, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using meat to substitute for our bread. So in this case, I'm using homemade Italian sausage, about one pound of it. I'm going to put the ingredients over here. Uh, so other people, what they do is they use beef, turkey, or sausage. But in this case, obviously, I'm using Italian sausage. Now for vegetables, we want to use one green bell pepper, half an onion, one jalapeno, and about four ounces of sliced mushrooms. Now for some of the other ingredients, we wanna use about four ounces of pepperoni, one pound of mozzarella cheese, one jar of pasta sauce or pizza sauce. Really, that's up to you on what you wanna use. Now for our dry ingredients, we wanna use fennel seed, garlic powder, oregano, and then finally basil. Now what's kinda of nice about our dry ingredients that makes it a little bit easier for us, we're only gonna use about half a teaspoon for all these things. But with that said, let's start cooking. So for the equipment, you're gonna to want to have an oven, a stove top or a hot plate, a little pot to hold our meat in, a cooking tray, which is about nine and a half by 13 inches. This is gonna hold all of our ingredients, a plastic spatula for chopping up the meat in the pot and stirring our ingredients inside the cooking tray. And we're gonna to want to have a metal spatula to cut the pizza in the end. You're also going to want to have a knife and a cutting board so we can cut up our vegetable ingredients. We want a measuring spoon, like a teaspoon or half a teaspoon, 
We're gonna use this for our dry ingredients. You're gonna to want to have oven mitts because we're gonna be using that to take our pizza out. And also it's kind of handy too if you have a couple of oven mitts or some kind of heat resistant material to put on the surface. You're gonna want cooking spray. This is gonna be used when we're like before we throw all of our ingredients in the cooking tray. And then finally, you're gonna to want to have some kind of like paper towel or plate to hold all the ingredients as you're doing all the work that you're doing on the side. And maybe a tiny little cup too to hold the dry ingredients. So then you can put that in when you're starting to put all the vegetables and meat together in the end. Also, I should mention that for the oven, you wanna be sure to preheat your oven to 350 degrees. That's gonna be the temperature that we're gonna be cooking our pizza at. So now that we got all of our ingredients ready, now we can start cooking. So one of the first things we wanna do is we wanna turn our stove top, or I'm using this like portable burner, and we wanna start cooking our Italian sausage. Basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna make sure we get our crust all nice and done that's going to be one of the foundations for the pizza. But while that's cooking, I'm going to start working on some other stuff like the dry ingredients and cutting up our vegetables. Also, what I should mention is be sure to keep an eye on the meat that you're cooking. We want to make sure that this is pretty much done. So make sure that it's not raw. But while it's cooking, be sure to chop it up into finer bits because this is going to make it a lot easier to stir up and use as a base layer for our pizza. Now that our Italian sausage is done, now we're gonna put it in our pan. Now, in some cases, what you're gonna to wanna to do is, depending upon what type of meat you, you have, you'll see like a whole bunch of fat at the bottom. It's gonna look kind of liquidy. Well, in that case, we wanna drain that. We don't wanna put that in our pan. But surprisingly, this Italian sausage didn't have that much fat. But with that said, we can finally start making our pizza. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is we wanna try and spread our pizza crust or <laughs> our Italian sausage as evenly as possible. If we can, we wanna also try and mash up some of these bits that kinda of got a little too big. So with that, cause again, we wanna try and not make sure we don't have like, you know, one side that has this, you know, all this meat, but like nothing. Cause remember, this is gonna be basically the crust to our pizza. So we wanna try and spread the love as much as possible. I should also mention that this pan is nine and a half by 13 inches. That's what this recipe calls for. And that's what you're gonna wanna use when you're making your pizza. So now that we got the crust kinda as even as we can, considering that's not really dough, now it's time to use the pizza sauce and then all the other, <laughs> all the other ingredients. So as I said, stated before, we're gonna use one jar of pasta sauce, and this is about 24 ounces. Now remember, you can also use pizza sauce, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour our lovely pizza sauce or pasta sauce all up in this pan. Next, we're gonna put a little bit of our dry ingredients in here too. And don't worry if it looks a little like uneven, we're gonna start stirring this bad boy up to make it a little bit more uniform. All right, so now that we got all of our ingredients, as far as our vegetables and some of those other great little bits, now it's gonna be time to add, well not add, but what I should say is like to stir this up because one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna try and make sure that this is as even as possible because this is gonna be infused inside our our crust. And plus we want to, it's almost like a blend of our, our crust from the, from the sausage and from the vegetables and stuff. All right. So now that we got our crust pretty much made, now we're going to throw it into our oven. Now remember we had this set to 350 degrees earlier. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put it inside the oven for about 40 minutes. Now, the reason why that we want to put our pizza in, or at least the crust in there for 40 minutes, we have a lot of wet ingredients. So let's just say had I thrown the cheese and the pepperoni on top, um, you know, and just threw it in right now, what will happen is once the pizza gets done, it's gonna be a little bit more runny and a little bit more soupy. 
Well, we don't want that. We want to cook down a lot of the more wet ingredients in the oven. So again, we set it to 350 degrees and we set the timer for about 40 minutes. So I'll see you all in 40 minutes. And after that, we're going to be throwing on the cheese and the pepperoni. Or also, I guess I should say is for you, you can use whatever other toppings you want. For this case, we're just going to be using pepperoni. See y'all later. All right, now it's been about 40 minutes. Now we're ready to pull out our pan. And keep in mind, this is not the finished pizza yet. We haven't put on our toppings just yet. All right. So this is what our pizza looks like, at least the crust so far. So what we need to do is now we need to put on our cheese and our toppings. Now keep in mind, you don't have to use pepperoni you can use whatever toppings you want. In this case, we're gonna use about four ounces of pepperoni and one pound of mozzarella cheese. And now we're gonna start building our pizza. All right, so now that we got our ingredients on, now we're gonna put this inside the oven for about 30 minutes. Now keep in mind that you can cook this to 20, 30 minutes, but this is gonna be based on what you personally like. So for us, we like it for 30 minutes, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull out 20 to show you how the cheese and how the pizza looks after 20 minutes. All right, 20 minutes have just passed. Now we're gonna see how the cheese looks after or how our pizza looks after 20 minutes. So this is how the pizza looks after 20 minutes. Now, if this is what you like, feel free to stop here with the sit for five minutes, cut a slice, and then throw it on your plate. But for us here at this house, we like it to cook it a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw this delicious, deliciously smelling pizza back in the oven for about 10 more minutes. After 10 more minutes, It'll be time to slice and eat. All right, I'll see y'all after 10 minutes. All right, so now 10 minutes have passed and now we're ready for our pizza. That is a little hot. And I wish you guys could smell this. Wish there was a way that there was like a smell of vision or something like that. Because this is what we got right here. This is our crustless pizza. I mean, like I said, I wish you guys the smell. Like, the smell is just amazing. But yeah, so this was Millennial Meals. This was Crustless Pizza. I'll see you guys next time. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson, and welcome to Millennial Meals place where we show you how to make delicious meals or treats right in your own home. Well, in this video, I was thinking of doing something a little bit different. So all the previous ones has been basically always meat oriented. Well, this one, I want it to be sweeter. I want it to be kind of like a more delicious, like almost like bite-sized treat. So on this video, we're gonna be making puppy chow, or as other people call it, muddy buddies. So let's do that now. All right, so for ingredients, we're gonna to want to have powdered sugar, Czech cereal, dark chocolate chips, vanilla extract, creamy peanut butter, and butter, or you can use margarine. Now, kind of rewinding back to the ingredients, I'm gonna talk about the Czech cereal and some of these other things for a minute. So for the Czech cereal, you don't have to use the brand, but what I would say is you don't use rice, um, use the corn version. Um, the reason being is that the rice, I feel like kind of gets stuck in my teeth and stuff, and overall, I don't really like it. I feel like the corn has a better crunch to it. Now, for the chocolate that we're gonna use, you can use semi-sweet or milk chocolate, but in this case, I want dark chocolate because I feel like I like that flavor better with this type of recipe. Now for the peanut butter, be sure to get creamy peanut butter. Now you could use crunchy, but I always feel like crunchy makes it a lot harder to mix all these ingredients together, especially when you're trying to coat the actual cereal. Um, that's just my personal preference, but I would definitely say stick with creamy because it makes it a lot easier when you mix these four ingredients together in this small bowl. Now for equipment, what we're gonna wanna use is, we're gonna definitely wanna have a microwave because that's gonna be the, the main say, kind of like how all the other videos we either had a stove top, an oven, or a smoker. Well, this time we're going to be using microwave. So in this video, we're going to want to be sure that we have one large bowl with a lid that we can fix on that doesn't really like leak, a smaller bowl to fit these four nice ingredients in, or uh, what I should say is if you don't have a large bowl with a lid, um, you can substitute it with a large plastic bag. In this case, I'm using one giant gallon bag. 
I'm just gonna use this to store later because I have the bowl, but if you don't have a bowl like this, then you can use a giant bag, like a giant Ziploc bag, I should say, um, to mix up your puppy chow. Now for our measuring instruments, we want to have at least one teaspoon and one cup. And then uh, as far as our stirring instrument, just a simple fork, because this is what we're gonna be using to stir these four ingredients right here in this little bowl. So with that said, let's start making some puppy chow. So here are the ingredients in detail for the puppy chow. Nine cups of Czech cereal, one cup of semi-sweet chocolate chips, or you can use dark chocolate chips like I did. And I also used a nine ounce bag to make it a little bit easier for myself. Three fourths cup of creamy peanut butter, one fourth cup of butter, or you can use margarine, one teaspoon of vanilla, and one and a half cups of powdered sugar. Now keep in mind, uh, you may have to use more powdered sugar than what this recipe calls for. So once you measured out your Czech cereal, you're gonna to wanna to put that into a large bowl and set that aside. Then with your other ingredients, you wanna grab the smaller bowl and put in your chocolate chips, peanut butter, and butter. Then what you'll do is you'll put that in the microwave and cook it for about one minute. Take it out, then stir that mixture up. Then if it's still kinda of chunky, then put it back in for another 30 seconds. If not, then you can put in your vanilla, then stir that again until that's nice and smooth. All right, so now that we got our peanut butter and our chocolate lead mix all nice and just look how like smooth that is, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour this over our cereal um, because again, like I was saying in the beginning, this is basically gonna be the glue that's gonna hook our powdered sugar onto the cereal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna want to have a wooden, like a little spatula with a little rubber like top on it. And that's why I should have mentioned in the beginning that we're gonna need one of these bad boys. So now we begin pouring. Now make sure when you're doing this, make sure you try to get it as even as possible because we, you know, the more, like when each, I should say is with, with each cereal, like the more chocolate that's on it, the more the, of that powdered sugar can actually sit there and just mix with our cereal and hold that sugar there. So be sure when you're doing this, like sometimes you might need a, another hand, but you want to make sure, again, I keep saying make sure, but I mean, it goes without saying that you want this to be as even as possible. So then each little bit has all that nice combination of chocolate, peanut butter, butter, and powdered sugar. All right, so now things are kind of slowing down a bit. So what we're gonna wanna do is use our, wooden, our little spatula with a little rubber top. And we're gonna want to basically get that extra chocolate, because remember, this ain't gonna help us with our recipe or our puppy chow if it's just sitting here not doing anything. So just make sure you get that nice and coated on your cereal. And also, I will lie, this has been years since I've made this, so I'm looking forward to at least having a couple of bites. I can't eat too much, but I can't wait to try a little bit because it's been years. This was like one of my go-to treats back in high school and college. And now I get to share with you one of my favorite desserts. And right now, this cereal is like, it's just coated right now. There's little stragglers here and there, but overall, it's just coated. And I can't wait until all that powdered sugar starts to get on it. So at this stage, when you pour all your chocolate into your mix, uh, be sure you try to stir it up because if you see any pieces that kind of look like, you see, that kind of look like this, well, I mean, uh, when this goes, like when we have the powdered sugar, yeah, a little bit of the powdered sugar is gonna get on it, but not a lot. We want it to kind of look like some of these pieces, like maybe like, hold on. Kind of like this. We want this piece to look more like these pieces. So when you're at this stage, just make sure that everything gets nice and coated because again, this is gonna be the glue that's gonna hold our powdered sugar. And plus, why not have every little bit taste just as good as the last bite or the first bite? Okay, that looks good. Now we're pretty much at the final stage as far as adding ingredients. Now in this stage, I'm gonna add one cup and a half of powdered sugar. Now keep in mind that you can use whatever you want until this stuff gets nice and coated. So again, as before, we wanna make sure that we got this stuff pretty even. With this, I'm probably gonna use a little bit more than one and a half because I used a little bit more chocolate. But other than that, you're gonna see why we have the lid, or if you don't have the lid, why we want the plastic bag. Also, 
this is kind of a messy thing, so be sure you have, you know, enough area to work in and uh, you might get a little messy. Luckily, I don't have anything on me yet. All right, now we start making the puppy chow. Basically, we baked and now we shake. So, as before, like I was saying, make sure you have a big lid and a big bowl so you can put everything together and start shaking. Now, keep in mind, if you don't have the bowl or the lid, you can always use this plastic bag to put your puppy chow in. But other than that, you start shaking. Now, like I was saying earlier, remember when I was saying that you might want to use more powdered sugar? Well, I think this needs a little bit more powdered sugar. One and, one and a half cups just ain't gonna do it. So, remember, this is up to you. This is what you want to leave it at. Trust me, this is gonna taste pretty dang good. Now, if you want it to be a little bit more coated with more powdered sugar, feel free to do it. It's better to do it now while the uh, peanut butter and chocolate chips are all pretty wet and still kind of warm. So. Again, you know, just add as much powdered sugar as you want. Now, you could have stopped at one and a half cups, but to be honest with you, I think Money Buddies need to be a little bit more coated with powdered sugar. All right, we're starting to get there, but I think it needs a little bit more. I know it's, it's gonna be like a thing, it's like, it needs more powdered sugar. Because we're starting to get there, like it's starting to get nice and coated. So I guess at this point, you know, probably like three cups of powdered sugar, at least for the batch that I made right here. So we just begin again. All right, so this is what puppy chow should look like, at least how I always made it. Nice and coated. Um, I should say that's probably, that's definitely not one and a half cups of sugar. Um, that's probably about three and a half cups of sugar. But oh my God, like, like the smell of it is just so good and this is just bringing back all those days in college when I was like doing math homework and just had like one of these things to like snack on. But um, with that said, uh, remember when it comes to the recipes, um, it really is up to you on what you want to use as far as like, like the amount of powdered sugar or the chocolate or the peanut butter. I mean, go crazy with it. I mean, experiment and see what you like. Um, what I should say again is that, you know, in this case I was using, you know, a large bowl with a, you know, a large lid to shake this. Now you could have done the basically the same thing with a plastic bag, but I was saying have this on hand in case you don't have this set up right here. Oh, also bonus video. This is how you would use that plastic bag if you didn't have the large bowl or lid. But with all that said, this was Millennial Meals on how to make puppy chow or muddy buddies. Y'all stay safe and have a good one. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkson and welcome to Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals or treats in your own home. So in the last episode, we done puppy chow, something a little sweet. Well this time, I was thinking that was a little bit more spicy. So in this episode, we're going to be making bacon wrapped jalapeno poppers. Let's start baking. For equipment, you'll need a bowl to mix our cream cheese and cheddar cheese in, a knife to cut our jalapenos, a cutting board, toothpicks to hold the jalapenos and the bacon together, a measuring cup, a spoon to mix our cheddar cheese and cream cheese and to scoop out some of the jalapeno's guts or some of the, like, the innards. A pan to cook our jalapeno's on. Parchment paper or aluminum foil. Rubber mats or pot holders. You don't want to touch a hot surface or hot metal. And then finally scissors so then we can cut the parchment paper or aluminum foil. So for ingredients you're going to want to have jalapeno's, room temperature cream cheese, cheddar cheese, and finally bacon. Now keep in mind, you don't have to use bacon when it comes to what you want to put in your jalapenos. Some people put hamburger, some people put chicken, but in this case, I'm going to use bacon because I think it's going to look pretty when it's all wrapped around these jalapenos. And also I should mention is as a bonus, I'm going to put a little bit of smoked brisket in some of these jalapenos because I'm going to be combining two things I love, bacon and smoked brisket. But before, that's all I said, like before I start doing all this, I'm going to preheat my oven to 400 degrees. And while that's heating up, I'm going to start prepping out all this stuff and we're going to start baking. So one of the first things you want to do is stir the cream cheese and cheddar cheese together until the cheddar is evenly distributed in the cream cheese. 
For the jalapenos, we'll cut them in half and then scoop out the innards or the guts of the jalapenos with a spoon. You can leave out more pepper seeds or the insides depending upon what your preference is. Keep in mind the more pepper seeds you put in there or leave in there I should say, the spicier is going to be. So this is going to be one of those things, what's your heat tolerance going to be and then go on from there. If you want, you can cut up other pieces of meat or other ingredients to put inside your jalapenos. Once all of our ingredients are ready, we'll grab half a jalapeno slice and fill it with our cheesy mix. Keep in mind, if you make them too full, it may be harder to put your other meats or ingredients in the jalapeno. Once our half pepper is filled, we'll grab another half slice to make it whole. The jalapeno will be then wrapped with our bacon slice, and then we'll put a toothpick through the bacon and the pepper to add that final touch. Once our peppers are wrapped, we'll cook them in the oven for 15 minutes at about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now keep in mind too, you don't have to basically do what I did here where I made a whole jalapeno filled with cheese and then wrapped it with bacon. You could just do half slices and then wrap each half slice of pepper with your cheesy mix and bacon. So this is a preference thing, but on this run, I wanted to make a whole pepper filled with cheese and meat and then wrapping it up with bacon. Again, this is your preference. You either can do half slices with bacon wrapped around it or a whole pepper pod and have bacon around it or whatever other thing you want to do. All right, now that we got our jalapeno poppers all nice and wrapped up, we're now gonna throw this inside the oven for about 15 minutes. So the uh, oven timer is off. Uh, basically, I had to go a little bit higher than 15 minutes. I had to go about 25 minutes. Uh, main reason being is that I like my bacon and everything else to be a little bit crispier. But all said and done, we now have our jalapeno poppers. So <laughs> this is how you make jalapeno poppers. Uh, this is one of my favorite treats to make as far as uh, having like a bacon and brisket combo. But I mean, what I'm just kind of like taking in right now, you just hear that nice sizzling sound. And the smell is just amazing. Now keep in mind when it comes to how you make your own jalapeno poppers, you don't have to use bacon. You can use hamburger, you can use chicken. And then as far as like the innards, like the guts, like where we use the cream cheese and cheddar, you can put whatever seasonings you want. I've seen people put paprika, garlic, salt, all different type of things. But for me, I just want to make this simple. Just have the jalapenos, cream cheese, cheddar, and bacon. And uh, a little bit of brisket on the inside too. But as far as that's concerned, this was Millennial Meals on how to make jalapeno poppers. Y'all stay safe and have a good one. Hi there y'all, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson and welcome to Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals or treats right in your own home. So for this episode, I was kind of like in the mood for a movie and well, what goes good with the movie? Well, popcorn. Well, I didn't want to use microwavable popcorn or stuff you buy in a bag. Oh no, I gotta pop it myself. So in this episode, we're gonna show you how to pop your own popcorn and give it that taste as if you got it from the movie theater. So let's start popping. So for ingredients, I'm going to be using popping oil, Orville Renbacher popcorn kernels. Now, if you have uh, kernels that pop better, have a better flavor, or are easier to work with, let me know, because I'm always on the hunt for better ingredients that make my food or treats taste better. And then finally, our secret ingredient is going to be Flavicol. Now with this, we're not going to use a lot of it, but it does make a huge difference in how our popcorn tastes. Now for our equipment, you're going to want to have at least a pot. In this case, I'm using a four quart pot. Now you don't have to use this size because a lot of these ingredients you can basically upscale based on your pot size. We're gonna wanna have a burner top, so either like a stove top or something like this, to cook our popcorn kernels. You're gonna wanna have a quarter cup, a teaspoon, and then finally a bowl to hold our delicious popcorn in. With that said, let's start popping. So one of the first things we wanna do is we wanna turn on our stove top and then put it onto about a medium heat or something. So don't put it on to the max or the highest level possible. Then we're gonna to wanna to get about one quarter cup of oil. Our oil right up there. Put that in our pan 
or a pot, I should say. Then what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna put about four or five kernels. And what we're waiting here, like what we're waiting for is all these kernels will pop because what that's gonna basically be like our alarm clock to tell us to throw in the rest of our kernels. And now right now we just wait for our popcorn to pop and then we can go on from there. All right, now that we have the kernels that we had in there pop, that means we're ready to add in the rest of the kernels that we need. So for this, I'm gonna add 3 fourths cup of popcorn kernels. So we're gonna measure that out. Then next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add one teaspoon of Flavicol. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and kind of get a little evenly spread out into our pan or pot I should say. Then I'm gonna shake it around so then that so then that salt kind of gets in there so it's not just in one location. Okay. And I think we're ready. Woo! Do not touch hot surfaces. <laughs> Now that we have our popcorn sizzling away, we'll want to have a lid on our pot because popcorn will fly out. With the lid on, periodically shake your pot to make sure the pop pieces don't get burnt. If the pot gets too full, you'll need to dump out some of your popcorn into your bowl to make room for other unpopped kernels. Once it sounds like your popcorn isn't popping as much as it did earlier, it'll then be time to dump the rest of your popcorn into your bowl and to enjoy. All right, well, it looks like your popcorn is finally done. And from the looks of it, it has that nice color that we want, and it should have that delicious flavor. But with that said, I'm going to start dumping this into my bowl. All right, we got that. So keep in mind, when you're making your popcorn, there may be some unpopped kernels. So even if you like have like a, this pot filled with kernels, every once in a while, you're going to have one that's going to maybe have like quite a few kernels that are unpopped. That happens. Not every kernel is gonna pop, but some kind of come out semi-pop, and those are what we call the old maids. So, like this one right here, I would say that's an old maid, and these are good. Have the same flavor and a nice crunch to them. With that said, this is Monial Meals on how to make popcorn that tastes like you got from the movie theater. Y'all stay safe and have a good one. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson, and welcome to Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals or treats right in your own home. So in the previous episodes, we've done an unboxing or maybe like brisket. Well, in this one, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do a drink, more specifically a mixed drink because everyone has a long day or they just want to experience a different flavor during the week. So on this episode, we're going to be showing you how to make a mojito. Let's start mixing. For equipment, we want one tablespoon a stirring spoon, usually used with mixed drinks and stuff like that, a jig, a cup of ice, a pour spout, and finally, a cup for our drink. So for ingredients, we're gonna be using 10 mint leaves, ice, lime juice, club soda, white rum, and finally, sugar. In this case, though, I'm using stevia because I'm watching what I'm eating, or what I should say, drinking. So keep in mind, when you're making yours, you can use stevia, real sugar, or a syrup. But with that said, let's start mixing. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to grab 10 mint leaves. We want to make sure that they're kind of like decent in size. Either you can get them from the store or you can get your own mint plant. This stuff was growing right in my backyard. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to clap because we're going to be making a good drink. We want to release some of that scent and we're going to drop that into our drink. Next thing we want to do is we want to add two ounces of rum. Next what we want to do is we want to add two tablespoons of sugar. Next we want to add one ounce of lime juice. And keep in mind you don't have to use lime juice. Some people use freshly squeezed lemons. I mean I should say limes. So you don't have to use lime juice. You could use a fresh lime 
squeezed inside your drink. Next, we're gonna to top it off with ice. So I think that's about a good amount for this drink. And now for one of the final ingredients, we're gonna be using four ounces of club soda. Okay, now that we have our final ingredient, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to stir this puppy up. Okay, with that said, now I'm gonna add some final touches to my mojito. And then I'm gonna put one little lime wedge in there. And now we just made a mojito. Keep in mind when you're making your mojito, it's up to you on what kind of ingredients you wanna use. You wanna use more lime juice, you wanna use real limes, that's up to you. Or if you wanna use syrup or real sugar, again, that's up to you on what you wanna put inside your mojito. With that said, this is how you make a mojito. Y'all stay safe and have a good one. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson and welcome to the Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals and treats right in your own home. So today I was going to do something with a little bit more of a Spanish influence, so today we're going to be making quesadilla. Let's start cooking. So for the ingredients, we're going to be using chicken. In this case, I'm using smoked chicken, two tortilla shells, two-thirds cup cheddar cheese, olive oil, and then finally, some fajita seasoning. So for the equipment, we're going to want to have a stovetop, a pan, a plate, a cutting board and knife, a spoon or fork, or some other kind of utensil that will help you flip your quesadilla, a measuring cup, then finally, a spatula. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to get our meat all sliced up to line up on our tortilla shell. In this instance, I'm going to be using smoked chicken. Now when it comes to you, you can use whatever meat you want, but in this instance, it's going to be smoked chicken for me. So I want to cut this into thin slices because that's going to make it a lot easier to line up my tortilla shell. That said, let's start slicing. Now that we have all of our chicken sliced up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil to my pan. Next, I'm gonna take one of my tortilla shells. I'm gonna put that in the pan. I'm gonna rub that in a little bit because what I wanna do is it's gonna make it a little bit easier to make my tortilla shell crispy because I do like my uh, I do like my quesadillas pretty crispy. And we got that in there. I'm gonna add a little bit of my fajita seasoning. Not too much. Next one I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add one third cup of my cheddar cheese. I'm gonna sprinkle that kind of evenly on my quesadilla because this is gonna act like our glue for our chicken and the shell. So I'm just gonna do that, mix that around a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna add a little bit more seasoning because I do like this seasoning a lot. It's up to you on what seasoning you want, but in this case, I'm gonna be using fajita seasoning. Next, what we wanna do is we wanna add our chicken to our quesadilla. So the focus here, you wanna make sure that you're getting your quesadilla shell, or at least I should say, these tortilla shells pretty evenly mixed with your chicken. So kind of like have it spread out because what we don't want to have is we don't want to have a spot to where there's like this huge bald spot like right here then there's like a pack of just like just filled with chicken so we want to kind of make it even that's why i was like saying having our slices or our pieces a little bit smaller so in that way it makes it a lot easier for us to kind of distribute our chicken somewhat evenly throughout our quesadilla shell now that we have our chicken added we're going to add another third cup of cheddar cheese Like I was saying earlier, we want to have our cheddar cheese somewhat evenly spread out. Because again, this is gonna be our glue that's gonna hold our chicken and our quesadilla shell together. Or I should say our tortilla shells together. Right. Next one I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some more fajita seasoning. Because I really do like this stuff. And plus I love it when it's infused into the cheese. Okay, looks like that's good. Now with our other tortilla shell, I'm gonna put that on top. 
I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil on that. Because this is gonna come in handy once we flip our tortilla shell. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to make sure that that olive oil I put on top is evenly distributed. And again, if it looks like I'm adding a lot, it's because I do love making my tortilla shells crispy. Some people like them to have like a little light brown or like goldish brown. For me, I like to have mine a little bit browner and I like to have mine a little bit crispy. So this is gonna be a preference thing. If you don't wanna add as much as I did, you're more than welcome to add less. But this is, is I'm making a quesadilla the way I love to make it, which is fast, easy, and quick. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat up my hot plate because I wanna get my quesadilla nice and crispy. Some people like to get it that golden brown, but for me, I like to have mine a little bit darker and a little bit crispier. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna play the waiting game to see how crispy I can get my quesadilla. So while your quesadilla is cooking, every once in a while you want to probably check under to see how the shell looks. So in this case I'm going to use a little bit of a spoon and a spatula to check on the underside to see how brown it's getting. So right now it's not really at the point where I want it at, so we got to play a little waiting game. But every once in a while make sure you check the shell to see if it's at that level that you want it to be before you flip it to the other side. Alright, so I think my quesadilla is ready to lip oh yeah it's totally ready so in this case this is a lot easier to do when you have like one of these spatulas that kind of bends at a slight angle so i'm going to do is i'm going to have i'm going to set one side like this so i'm going to have it you can look make it kind of kind of give you an idea because this kind of gives you a little bit of a leverage then what i'm going to do is i'm just going to flip it like that and that's the that's the type of brown i want i want it to kind of look like this, I really like how it kind of crispy I got it. Now what I should mention is, after when you flip it, it's not gonna take long for the other side to get cooked up. And again, this is how I like making it. If you have a different way you wanna make it, feel free to do that. But this is my quick and dirty way of making my quesadillas. I love getting a little bit crispier than this, so probably a little bit darker. Um, again, what I should mention is that you wanna make sure you're checking the shell, because after when you flip it, the other side gets done a lot quicker. So you want to make sure you're checking that a lot more often than when you were checking the first side. But yeah, it's definitely an art when it comes to flipping the quesadilla with one spatula. Because I've seen some people, they have like two pans together and then they're like flipping it like this and stuff. And some, or they get a plate and they kind of like flip it that way and then they slide it into the pan. Um, I should mention that this took me a lot of practice to be able to flip it with just one spatula. Uh, but like I said, you probably want to try the plate and the other pan method, but... Uh, for me, this is, like I said, my quick and dirty way of making my quesadilla. So again, what we want to do is we want to make sure, checking how our shell looks, looks like we still got a little bit more time. So we want to make sure that we don't want to burn the other side, because we don't want the side to be like this, kind of like a little bit brownish color, and then the other side being like pitch black or like not cooked at all. So be sure you're checking your quesadilla at least the shells to see how it looks for you. See if it has that right crispiness or that right doneness for you. Okay, so personally, I think the quesadilla is to the doneness that I want. So once it comes to when you're looking at your quesadilla and when you want to get it off the pan, you can you know get it off the way that you want, but I usually First thing I do is I check to see if it's the right color. I like the way it looks. Again, I guess because how I, I was able to like flip it earlier. You can put it in your plate for easy delivery, and then you can take it to your cutting board. And then what we can do is we can start slicing our quesadilla. The way that I make this, it can serve about maybe two or three people. And then what we do is we just want to cut our quesadilla. So I'm going to cut this into about four pieces. So once your quesadilla is done, when it has that nice coloration that you want, you want to slide it off onto a cutting board, then cut it to however many slices you want. In this case, I wish I got mine a little bit browner than this, but other than that, this is how you make a quick and dirty quesadilla. 
Y'all stay safe and have a good one. For the equipment, you're going to want to have a cutting board, a knife, a spoon, a stovetop, a spatula, a pan, a cooking tray, an oven, pot holders, and this is optional, but you can get parchment paper. This makes it a little bit easier for cleanup when you put it on your cooking tray after when everything's said and done, because then you just maybe wipe down your cooking tray a little bit and you just throw away the parchment paper. But that is the equipment that you'll need to make these stuffed bell peppers. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson, and welcome to Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals and treats right in your own home. So one of the previous episodes, we made jalapeno poppers, which was basically a jalapeno pepper that was hollowed out and we filled with some delicious flavors. Well, I was kind of craving that same flavor. So on this episode, I'm going to be showing you how to make stuffed bell peppers. Let's start baking. So one of the first things I want to do is I want to cut up my mushrooms, my garlic, and my onion and well, a little bit of the bell pepper because basically what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be cutting off the top, then scooping out the core. That way when we make our stuffing, I have a, I can like put more of that stuffing inside my bell pepper. But uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start cutting that and then prepping some of the other ingredients as well. So one of the first things we wanna do is we wanna start getting our stuffing ready. And that means we gotta get our vegetables cut up so then we can add that with our Italian sausage. So in this case, I'm gonna be using mushrooms, garlic, and onion. I'm gonna slice these up, put them in the pan, and then throw my Italian sausage after. Stir that nice concoction up, and then throw that inside our bell peppers. And when it comes to bell peppers, we're not gonna slice these up to the you know, nth degree. Basically, I'm just gonna cut off the top, and then scoop out the core, and then put the stuffing inside, put some cheese, and bake it. Um, with that said, I'm gonna start slicing. So what you want to do is you want to cut up your mushrooms, garlic, and onions. Get your garlic and your onions together, put your stove top to medium heat, and throw your garlic and onions into the pan. Uh, for me personally, I like to throw a little bit of olive oil to kind of like cook them together to kind of give it a little bit of an extra flavor. Once the onions get to a more clear color, then I'm going to add in my Italian sausage to the mix. But as the meat is cooking, I'm going to prepare the bell peppers. So this will be a good time to cut off the tops of your bell peppers and to scoop out the innards or the guts of the little bell pepper. Now what I'm doing here is I'm using a knife to kind of cut around the edges. Now be very gentle because you don't want to cut in the direction of yourself. Um, this should not require that much pressure to cut off some of the, the innards and then be able to pull it out. If you have to, you can also use a spoon to kind of scoop out some of the like seeds and stuff like that. But I decided to leave some of that stuff in there because I think that would add a little bit more flavor to my bell peppers. Now, sometimes you're going to have bell peppers that do not want to stand up, so they're going to fall over. Now, an easy fix for this is, well, you can possibly put it on, like, next to another bell pepper. But right here, what you do is you want to cut off the little, I guess, bottom that's extending out a little bit further. Once you cut it off, it should be able to sit nice and flush with your table or whatever surface you're putting it on. When the meat gets a little bit more done, you're going to want to throw in your mushrooms and whatever other ingredients that you kind of want to put inside your stuffing. In this case, I'm going to be using the mushrooms and some of the bell pepper pieces that I cut off from the tops um, because I don't want to waste any of that because the rest that I couldn't really use, I'm going to throw that in the composter. All right, now that my Italian sausage, or at least my stuffing is done, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stuff this into, or stuff this into my bell peppers. But I'm gonna actually use a spoon for that because it's gonna be a little bit harder to try and be accurate with the spatula. Alright, so 
So this is our stuffed bell peppers. I cooked it in the oven at 350 degrees and I cooked it for about 20 minutes. Um, so what I could have done better probably was have a little bit more mozzarella cheese, uh, but I wanted to be a little bit more keto friendly. I only put about a quarter cup of mozzarella cheese. And when you, if you remember at the beginning, I had this at pretty much at the very top, like just level. But as you can see, obviously it kind of melted more and it kind of got down into the more the bottom of our, basically our stuffed bell pepper. But other than that, I'm still gonna enjoy this and still, you know, just eat the heck out of it. But with that said, that's how you make stuffed bell peppers. Y'all stay safe and have a good one. Hi there, my name is Malcolm Wilkinson, and welcome to Millennial Meals, a place where we show you how to make delicious meals and treats right in your own home. So I was kind of craving something a little bit more crunchy. Now, I didn't want to get potato chips or something a little less healthy for me, so I want to go with something a little bit more organic. So on this episode, I'm going to be showing you how to make pumpkin seeds. Let's get baking. So here's some of the things you're going to need to carve up your pumpkin. You're going to need some plate or bowls to hold the seed and guts. A pan. Now this is optional, but you can get parchment paper. It makes it a lot easier for cleanup after when you bake the seeds. A spatula, a carving knife, a scooper or spoon, and an oven. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cut a hole in the top of the pumpkin. So then I'll like pull this off like a cap or a lid, then use my scooper to get the seeds and the guts out. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate them out seeds in one plate and guts in the other because basically what I'm going to be doing is the guts is going to be put in my composter because that's going to be turned into compost so I can feed my pepper plants later and then my seeds which I'm going to season and bake in the oven so then I have my crunchy snack. But that said, I'm going to start carving my pumpkin. All right, now we're going to begin separating our seeds and our guts and then we're going to get this puppy started. All right, so it looks like I got all the seeds, or at least 99% of them, out of my pumpkin. Uh, now I can at least start baking. But I guess one thing I wanted to say is the reason why I used my hand initially was because when the seeds are entangled in the pumpkin guts, it's a lot easier to filter those seeds like into my hand and then get the guts out so then I can basically throw my seeds at the plate. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna use my scooper. I'm gonna get all the pumpkin guts out now. All right, so obviously I kind of butchered my pumpkin a little bit. I didn't realize how long the handle was and how small my pumpkin was. So I had to kind of like try and get my spoon or my scooper in there. And that's why I had to cut some of these pieces off. Normally you don't want to do this uh, because it's going to make it harder for you to put your lid on. Uh, luckily, I guess my lid still fits. I guess it's a little, little hole for me to put the candle in now. But um, the reason why I kind of kind of shifted and used it, this little spoon was because then that way I have enough room. So that's another thing I would say. Be sure you get a big enough pumpkin and carve a big enough hole so you can actually get your hand in there so you can get the seeds and the guts out. Um, so right now what I'm doing is I'm preheating my oven to 350 degrees because after when it's at 350, I'm going to bake these seeds for about 15 minutes. But first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw these on the pan and salt them. So once you put your pumpkin seeds inside the oven and start cooking them, every five minutes you're going to want to pull out the seeds and shift them around to get them more evenly baked so that one side doesn't get baked more than the other. The goal is to get them to a light brown color. All right, our pumpkin seeds are done. So I cooked that in the oven at 350 degrees and I cooked it for about 20 minutes. And then after when I looked at it, I was like, ah, it needs a little bit more. So I put in another five minutes, so basically 25 minutes. Uh, another thing is the reason why I left the guts on them and I didn't like wash them is because those pumpkin guts add a lot of flavor to these pumpkin seeds. Also, as far as seasoning, I just use sea salt uh, because one of my favorite snacks is pretzels. But again, I wanted something that was a little bit healthier and still had a little crunchy taste, so I just threw sea salt on these. Now, if you want to put other seasoning on your pumpkin seeds, feel free to do so. With that said, this is how you make pumpkin seeds. Y'all stay safe and have a good one.